Okay, guys, so we just got done with parametrics. Um, calculus of vectors is what's next. That is uh, sections 10.3 to 10.5. Now, 10.3 is a review of uh, the stuff on vectors that we covered, or a lot of the stuff, just rudimentary uh, computations, uh, addition, scalar multiplication, finding the unit vector of numerical vectors. Okay? Now, we're we're used to seeing numerical vectors. That's all 10.3. We're kind of pressed for time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and assume that you can review yourself on numerical vectors just by reading through the section, reading through your notes from last year. I want to concentrate on 10.4 and 10.5, which is actually the calculus of vectors. Uh, and the calculus of vectors comes up when you stop talking about vectors as numerical entities and start talking about what's called vector functions or vector valued functions. Okay, And the reason that they've come on the heels of parametrics is that they're related to parametrics. So let's say, for instance, that we have a vector like this, okay? And vector value functions are usually referred to as R of t, okay? R of t is a vector, and the, the actual numerical vector that happens at a particular time, t, is just when you plug in, plug in 3. Plug in 3, and you're going to get, you know, uh, root 2, root 2, and that's going to be the vector at that particular time. Okay, so it is a function. It is one input to one output. The input happens to be numerical. The output, the set of outputs, is um, a set of vectors. Okay, and so, and so basically, what happens here, and this is actually related to the parametric equations, uh, the set or pair of parametrics like this, okay? These two are related, and here's how, and I'm not going to draw that particular one, but whereas if I have a set, if I have uh, parametrics that give me this curve right here, if I'm dealing with parametrics, I am interested in where, and let's say that this uh, has to do with where a, a you know, projectile or a, you know, whatever is in motion, okay? A projectile is in motion and a set of parametric equations actually tells you where that object is, okay? So if parametrics tells you where an object is, uh, a vector value function tells you where the terminal end of a vector is, okay? So that's the only difference. Instead of telling you where an object is, it tells you where the terminal end, the terminal point of a vector is. And so basically you can sort of see this as you see this curve as uh, as dictating where the where the terminal uh, point of a vector and you can sort of imagine the vector sweeping through uh, this plane as its terminal point moves along this curve, okay? So that's it. So basically, a lot of the rules that we use um, to actually play with parametrics can be used to play with uh, vector value functions. And uh, oftentimes, sometimes when we're not, you know, we're a little bit, we're not quite as used to vector value functions and the notation and everything like that, sometimes it's helpful just to pull it off to the side and actually deal with it as it's related parametric. And actually, on the AP exam, a lot of times what you have is you have a free response question that actually treats, it actually jumps back and forth between dealing with a pair of equations in terms of t as either components in a vector value function. Remember, this is component form, right? Uh, and it actually could be just as easily done in unit vector form right? Unit vector form with the i and the j and then component form. Uh, you can do it, basically you can 
play with it back and forth, you can talk about it in terms of parametrics, you can talk about it in terms of a vector value function, uh, and it kind of helps to be able to sort of uh, traffic in both of those at the same time, or alternatively, okay. So what we're going to do is first, and since it's not exactly calculus right at the beginning because I just want to get you familiar with how to actually deal with vector value functions. Uh, but um, we're going to go ahead and uh, because of that, uh, because of wanting to introduce those, we're going to deal with the algebra of vector value functions and then move on to the calculus of them. So let's say that, let's go back to the one that I gave you right at the beginning. Uh, and a lot of these are uh, from your book, since your teacher is not using the book, uh, I will, okay? And these, uh, right now, these are ones from 10.4. Now let's say that it asks you to find the domain of the vector function. Now remember, domain is a set of all possible inputs. Uh, and when they talk about that, uh, you know, you're used to domain being x. Um, I think that they'll usually ask if they're, if they're looking for an interval on x, but I tell you what, let's actually see what sort of interval is implied for t, our parameter, uh, and then we'll basic, and then we'll talk about how that impacts the interval that is that is that that implies for basically your horizontal component, which we're used to thinking of in terms of x and our vertical component, what we're used to thinking about in terms of y. Now, both of these are radicals, should act, so it should actually be relatively easy. We know that t minus 1 needs to be greater than or equal to 0, and we know 5 minus t needs to be greater than or equal to 0. Basically, the radicand can't be negative. Uh, so let's just add 1 to both sides. Uh, let's just add t to both sides, and let's turn both of these around. Uh, and you'll see why here in just a second. If both of these have to be true, then we're looking for the intersection. It's an and. And of course, that means that this can be folded in together, creating a three-part three inequality. Uh, but it can also be put in interval notation from 1 to 5. Now, that is an interval on t. And then all you have to do if you're dealing with an interval on t is just determine what that means with respect to an interval on x. Okay, so my interval on x winds up being from 1, or basically 0, to root 4, 2. So on x, my interval is going to be 0 to 2. And then on, uh, on y, you know, plug in 1, you're going to get root 4, plug in 5, you're going to... It's going to be the same on y, it's just going to be, you know, in reverse order, but we still put it in, in ascending order. So our interval on y, our interval on x are both the same, and this is, of course, my interval on t, okay? So that's basically how you sort of play around with intervals on the particular, it's, it's basically the same thing that you were dealing with when you were dealing with domain questions in terms of functions, right? Just what is impossible and of course the allowed values are everything else. Uh, sometimes they even, when they're giving you a function, let's say they give you arctan of t and then e to the negative 2t. Well let's say that there's sort of an n behavior of sorts in that and they want to know what sort of what sort of vector this is approaching as t goes to infinity? Well, you can actually take the limit of this because all it is is instead of one expression, it's just uh, two expressions in the slant brackets or what we've called the vector majigs in the past. And so you're just taking the limit of two separate um, expressions rather than a single expression. Well, that's easy enough. What happens as the input goes to infinity of arctan? Well, you happen to know that arctan is that tangent period that got flipped about the y is equal to x and looks like this and runs from the asymptote negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So that first one, it's going to be approaching pi over 2 as t goes to infinity. Now, you have to remember also what this looks like when it's just a regular function. It is a 
exponential decay function, and as the input goes to infinity, it hugs the horizontal asymptote of the x-axis as it goes off to infinity, and so what we have here is zero. That is the numerical vector that this vector value function is approaching as its inputs t approach infinity. All right. Now, uh, oh, I'm going to need a little bit of graph paper for this particular one. Let's go ahead and look at number 9 in 10.4, okay? And it asks you, uh, it gives you the vector value function r of t. Uh, let me go ahead and see exactly how it words it. Let me flip back there. Do, 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 do. Okay. It says, sketch the curve with the given vector equation. Indicate with an arrow the direction in which t increases. Okay. Well, it, it goes r of t is equal to sine t i, and of course that's your horizontal component, right, because i is your horizontal unit vector, and cosine t j. Well, I don't like it in unit vector form. I would just automatically turn it into component form because that's just that's just who I am. Uh, and you have to remember, as such, this is actually related to the parametric equations sine t and cosine t for x and y respectively. Now, this is not the same as that, but this is related to it, okay? And that helps us because this right here is an ellipse. More specifically, it's a circle, okay? It's a circle with a radius of one. And what this is, is that if it's in parametrics, we assume that it's talking about maybe a particle traveling around the circumference of the circle, around and around and around and around and around. Whereas when we're dealing with it as a vector, it's basically a unit vector where the terminal end of it is basically spinning around the circle. Either way, whether it's a vector valued function or whether it is a, um, a set of parametric equations, a pair of parametric equations, it still stands to reason that it would be a good idea to know exactly what direction it's spinning in, right? Uh, because, you know, vectors are used in physics to represent forces. So you want to know not only where the force is at a particular time t, and, but how is that force changing? Which way is that force progressing? Well, the very easy way to do this is just start plugging in numbers, okay? So if I start plugging in numbers, let's plug in 0 for t. Well, if I start plugging in 0 for t, and we can go ahead and just do this off to the side, r of 0 is going to be sine 0, cosine 0, or 0, 1. Okay, well that tells me that right here is the terminal end at t is equal to 0. Okay, well, r of pi over 2 is going to be sine of pi over 2 and then cosine pi over 2 and that is going to give me 1 0 okay so it's moved from the terminal point of that vector has moved from here to here okay and then it's just going to continue to go around so you know we can just go ahead uh, and put the arrows like this. As t increases, it's going to be moving clockwise. And it actually starts at, you know, what we would consider to be 12 o'clock and just sort of cycles around as t increases. Okay? Okay, well, that's kind of nice to know. Uh, let's go ahead and let's deal with another example, sort of in that same subsection. This is number 12 in 10.4. And we have r of t is equal to t squared t cubed. <clears throat> now, right at the beginning, I mean, it might actually, the more and more you use this, the more and more you won't have to do this, but it's just fine to go ahead and turn this, or at least relate it, to its implied parametrics, 
which then if you were to go ahead and actually solve, right, uh, basically eliminate the parameter, you would wind up with y is equal to x to the 3 halves. Now, let's go ahead, I mean, that, that's, that's helpful right there, but let's go ahead and graph this. Now you certainly know that um, x is never going to be negative. Just look at the original. Look at the original right here. x is never going to be negative. Okay, it's always going to be non-negative because it's squared. Okay, y, however, can be positive or negative. That's how this would be a little bit different, right? So what we're going to do is we're just going to start plotting. Now I recognize that when I do, let's do, um, let's do r of negative two. Well, that's going to wind up being four negative 8. So I go over 4 and I come down 8 and I can plot a point right there. Okay, well how about r of negative 1? Well that's going to be 1, negative 1. And of course r of 0 and that's going to be 0, 0. And then r of 1 and that's going to be 1, 1. And then r of 2 is going to be 4, 8. So what I get here, let me make sure that I do this correctly, that's 8 right there, is it's going to come in like this and then bounce off and go up like that. And so we have not only its graph, the curve, but its directionality as well. Now, that's all well and good. Um, let's go ahead and do... Eh, I tell you what, we're running into about 17 minutes right now. Let's go ahead and call it quits right here for this particular video. We'll pick up another couple of algebraic problems at the beginning of video two before we then move on and, uh, and progress into the calculus of the vector value functions. Okay? Any questions, please feel free to email me. Bye-bye.